3. And now I am to close up with his exaltation. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. You will recollect, whilst I am speaking upon this exaltation, that it is really the exaltation of all the elect in the person of Christ, for all that Christ is, and all that Christ has, is mine. If I am a believer, whatever he is in his exalted person, that I am, for I am made to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. 1. First, dear friends, it was exaltation enough for the body of Christ to be exalted into union with the divinity. That was honor which none of us can ever receive. We never hope to have this body united with a God. It cannot be. Once has incarnation been done, never but once. Of no other man can it be said, he was one with the Father, and the Father was one with him. Of no other man shall it be said, that the deity tabernacled in him, and that God was manifest in his flesh, seen of angels, justified of the Spirit, and carried up to glory. 2. Again, Christ was exalted by his resurrection. Oh! I should have liked to have stolen into that tomb of our Saviour, I suppose it was a large chamber, within it lay a massive marble sarcophagus, and very likely a ponderous lid was laid upon it. Then outside the door there lay a mighty stone, and guards kept watch before it. Three days did that sleeper slumber there. Oh! I could have wished to lift the lid of that sarcophagus, and look upon him. Pale he lay, blood streaks there were upon him, not all quite washed away by those careful women who had buried him. Death exulting cries, I have slain him, the seed of the woman who is to destroy me is now my captive. Ah! How grim death laughed! Ah! How he stared through his bony eyelids, as he said, I have the boasted victor in my grasp. Ah, said Christ, but I have thee. And up he sprang, the lid of the sarcophagus started up, and he, who has the keys of death and hell, seized death, ground his iron limbs to. Powder, dashed him to the ground and said, O death, I will be thy plague. O hell, I will be thy destruction. Out he came, and in turn the watchman fled away. Startling with glory, radiant with light, effulgent with divinity, he stood before them. Christ was then exalted in his resurrection. 3. But how exalted was he in his ascension? He went out from the city to the top of the hill, his disciples attending him while he waited the appointed moment. Mark his ascension. Bidding farewell to the whole circle, up he went gradually ascending, like the exaltation of a mist from the lake, or the cloud from the steaming river. Aloft he soared, by his own mighty buoyancy and elasticity he ascended up on high, not like Elijah, carried up by fiery horses, nor like Enoch of old, it could not be said he was not, for God took him. He went himself, and as he went, I think I see the angels looking down from heaven's battlements, and crying, See the conquering hero comes. While at his nearer approach again they shouted, See the conquering hero comes. So his journey through the plains of ether is complete, he nears the gates of heaven, attending angels shout, Lift up your heads, ye everlasting gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. The glorious hosts within. Scarce ask the question, who is the king of glory, when from ten thousand thousand tongues there rolls an ocean of harmony, beating in mighty waves of music on the pearly gates and opening them at once, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lo! Heaven's barriers are thrown wide open and cherubim are hastening to meet their monarch. They brought his chariot from afar to bear him to his throne. Clapped their triumphant wings and said, the Saviour's work is done. Behold he marches through the streets. See how kingdoms and powers fall down before him. Crowns are laid at his feet, and his father says, Well done, my son, well done, while heaven echoes with the shout, Well done. Well done. Up he climbs to that high throne, side by side with the paternal deity. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. Four. The last exaltation of Christ which I shall mention is that which is to come, when he shall sit upon the throne of his father David, and shall judge all nations. You will observe I have omitted that exaltation which Christ is to have as the king of this world during the millennium. I do not profess to understand it, and therefore I leave that alone. But I believe Jesus Christ is to come upon the throne of judgment, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Sinner. 
thou believest that there is a judgment, thou knowest that the tares and wheat cannot always grow together, that the sheep and the goats shall not always feed in one pasture, but dost thou know of that man who is to judge thee, that he who is to judge thee is a man? I say a man, a man once despised and rejected. The Lord shall come, but not the same. As once in lowliness he came. A humble man before his foes. A weary man, and full of woes. Ah! No! Rainbows shall be about his head, he shall hold the sun in his right hand as the token of his government. He shall put the moon and stars beneath his feet, as the dust of the pedestal of his throne, which shall be of solid clouds of light. The books shall be opened, those massive books, which contain the deeds of both quick and dead. Ah! How shall the despised Nazarene sit triumphant over all his foes? No more the taunt, the jeer, the scoff, but one hideous cry of misery, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. O oh, ye, my hearers, who now look with contempt on Jesus and his cross, I tremble for you. O oh, fiercer than a lion on his prey, is love when once incensed. O oh, despisers! I warn ye of that day when the placid brow of the man of sorrows shall be knit with frowns when the eye which once was moistened by dewdrops of pity, shall flash lightning on its enemies, and the hand, which once was nailed to the cross for our redemption, shall grasp the thunderbolt for your damnation, while the mouth which once said, Come unto me, ye weary, shall pronounce in words louder and more terrible than the voice of the thunder, Depart ye cursed sinners. Ye may think it a trifle to sin against the man of Nazareth. But ye shall find that in so doing ye have offended the man who shall judge the earth in righteousness, and for your rebellion ye shall endure waves of torment in the eternal ocean of wrath. From that doom may God deliver you. But I warn you of it. You have all read the story of the lady, who, on her marriage day stepped upstairs, and seeing an old chest, in her fun and frolic stepped inside, thinking to hide herself an hour, that her friends might hunt for her. But a spring lock lay in ambush there, and fastened her down forever nor did they ever find her, until years had passed, when moving that old lumbering chest, they found the bones of a skeleton, with here and there a jeweled ring and some fair thing. She had sprung in there, in pleasantry and mirth, but was locked down forever. Young man, take heed that you are not locked down forever by your sins. One jovial glass, it is all. One moment step. So said she. But there's a secret lock lays in ambush. One turn into that house of ill fame, one wandering from the paths of rectitude, that is all. Oh, sinner! It is all. But dost thou know what that all is? To be fastened down forever. Oh! If thou wouldst shun this, list to me, whilst, for I have but one moment more, I tell thee yet again of the man who was chosen out of the people. Ye pr proud ones! I have a word for you. Ye delicate ones, whose footsteps must not touch the ground. Ye who look down in scorn upon your fellow mortals, proud worms despising your fellow worms, because ye are somewhat more showily dressed. What think ye of this? The man of the people is to save you, if you are saved at all. The Christ of the crowd, the Christ of the mass, the Christ of the people, he is to be your saviour. Thou must stoop, proud man. Thou must bow, proud lady. Thou must lay aside thy pomp, or else thou wilt ne'er be saved, for the saviour of the people must be thy saviour. But to the poor trembling sinner, whose pride is gone, I repeat the comforting assurance. Wouldst thou shun sin? Wouldst thou avoid the curse? My master tells me to say this morning, Come unto me all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I remember the saying of a good old saint. Someone was talking about the mercy and love of Jesus, and concluded by saying, Ah, is it not astonishing? She said, No, not at all. But they said it was. Why, she said, It is just like him, it is just like him. You say, Can you believe such a thing of a person? Oh yes, it may be said, that is just his nature. So you, perhaps, cannot believe that Christ would save you, guilty creature as you are. I tell you it is just like him. He saved Saul, he saved me, he may save you. Yeah, what is more, he will save you. 
for whosoever cometh unto him, he will in no wise cast out.